As global debt hits levels it has never been before, we find corresponding asset prices. Margin has increased, pushing stocks higher. Home equity loans are at record highs. Asset prices to income ratios are also at record highs. Devaluation of currencies against real goods continues to be pervasive. How can this be reversed without a major event occurring? You came here for the truth, so let me unveil that for you. Today we're going to look at the central banks. Will they pull the plug? Let's begin. Looking at this article out of Reuters, worldwide debt has risen to a record $226 trillion, more than three times the global annual economic output. Firms in more countries are struggling to service loans, and that comes just as the central banks are preparing to end their super cheap credit policies. World markets are expected to get confirmation over the next week that normalizing global interest rates from the extraordinary low levels introduced to offset the fallout of the 2009 credit crash is no longer just a U.S. phenomenon. We have seen what the Federal Reserve has done. They increased these fractional amounts over the last little while to bring up interest rates, and they're claiming that they're going to continue to do this. We have seen the ECB saying that they're going to pull back on their bond buying program. They have suggested that they are going to try and normalize things to some degree, but have no fear. They're still going to be money printing and there's still going to be reduction in interest rates and everything else. So don't worry. We're just going to try and slow down a little bit. And you can see that globally. That's what they're claiming, that they will bring back $1 trillion U.S. worth in liquidity over a 12-month period. Whether or not they're going to do that, I have no idea. My question is, how can they do this without causing a crisis? They want to do it slowly, but that doesn't matter. The European Central Bank will lay out its cuts to its two-and-a-half-year-old stimulus program on Thursday. The Bank of England looks to raise British interest rates for the first time in a decade, while the Fed is moving towards its third hike of the year. All claiming to do things, we'll see if they do it. I believe that if they are going to raise them to rates that are normal historically, then they will, of course, crash the markets. Canada's Central Bank held its key lending rate at 1% Wednesday, saying it weighted global uncertainties against a stronger economy pushing up inflation in its decision. Just recently, the central bank had raised interest rates, saying that the global economy was doing well, that the Canadian economy was doing very well. And now, we look at it, and they're suggesting otherwise. Oh, well, you know, we just want to be sure, so we're not going to increase the rates. That's all fine, but when you suggest something purposely to try and generate a frenzy or a, a run, then this is, should be anyway, causing concern for every speech you ever have, every statement you ever put out. How do we believe it if we keep seeing this happening over and over again? Well, of course, this is what people do. They believe the central bankers. The bank predicted inflation would rise to 2% in the second half of 2018 after picking up in recent months as the Canadian economy apparently soared. I don't know where those statistics are coming from. If you look at what's happening, you get the truth. And of course, I've talked about it so many times before, whether it's the home equity line of credits, the secondary mortgages, the fact that real estate prices continue to rise, that's what's keeping this going. If you have one peg holding the whole thing together. That's not safe. That's not a booming economy. That's called a bubble. But it also noted a strengthening Canadian dollar and substantial uncertainty about ge geopolitical developments and fiscal and trade policies, notably the negotiation of NAFTA. So what uncertainties could they be worried about when they're at a level of 1%? They were not even historically at a normal level. We are still at this level of, okay, this is an extreme crisis. Let's deal with it. You haven't brought it up. We're talking about not bringing up interest rates realistic to realistic levels 10 years. 10 years now. And you're trying to tell me that the economy is doing well? Okay, bring everything back to its normal level again. Well, of course you can't you know, crash the whole system. But people seem to forget about this information. 
It's okay. Today's statement is clearly a move to a more dovish stance by the Bank of Canada. That's according to CIBC. You'll look at this another month from now and get a completely different picture. It's a little bit ridiculous. But that's the news for you. All right, you're looking at this. I covered something about this recently. The S&P has gone 334 sessions without a 5% uh, drawdown, the fourth longest streak in history. 5%. Now, I've shown you, I believe, on this channel here before, the 3%. The market hasn't moved 3% in so many days, and it looks even more extreme when you see it as a 5%. Trading sessions without a 5% SPX drawdown. I mean, you're looking at this being the fourth highest. Other times were in the 90s, twice out of these three times in the 1990s. I believe it could definitely surpass some of these, if not move on to the highest. I don't deny that. People are always saying that I'm calling for a crash. I'm saying that there will be a crash. I'm saying these are the reasons for the crash, but there's no telling how far they can kick the can down the road. If you print money, you will push asset prices up. Print more money, push interest rates down, you'll push asset prices up. That's the way this works. It's not going to be as if the central banks are holding back and, and they're, you know, there's a lot of silly talk out there. It's pretty simple. Central banks print money, they buy shares, it pushes stocks up. If they dry up liquidity, they're going to basically watch everything come tumbling down. It doesn't take a genius to figure that out. I don't know what's so difficult. In contrast with historical seasonality patterns, SPX realized volume dropped in the month of September and it appears to be headed toward the third lowest value in the history of the index. S&P 500 realized volatility. Now they're showing October 17th, the date here. If it declines to this level, we will see the literally the third lowest in the history of this index. The market is suggesting right now that there's nothing to be concerned about, literally nothing, even though we have so many things geopolitically, for one, to be concerned about. The market shows nothing. Why? Because they know that central banks will just print up more money should they need to. And that's very frightening because you're essentially putting all your trust in the central bankers. Probably not a wise move. But I'll leave that to you. And some different information here. Some of the world's richest people were braced for their financial details to be exposed on Tuesday night after a major offshore company admitted that its computer records had been hacked. Appleby, a firm based in Bermuda with offices in many tax havens, said it was in the process of warning clients that they may be impl uh, implicated in a massive leak of sensitive information. So once again, a hack attack releasing people's information. This goes on all the time, whether it's Equifax, whether it's anything. So what the reason I mention this is because we have our information kept with different companies, one or another. Sometimes, you know, you give up information willingly and other times not so willingly. All of that is put into a database somewhere. These databases could be accessed by different people, different groups, that you do not want them to have that access. And yet, they get it. This is the danger of this technological age that we live in. It's one of the downsides. And we look at this and you just have to remind ourselves to be very careful what we do, try to give up, give up as little information as possible, and don't give in to anything that you don't need to. A growing percentage of renters believe it is cheaper to rent than to buy a home, which helped explain why the home ownership rate remains persistently low nearly a decade after the housing crash. It talks more about this, the statistics about renters and home buyers, tries to make this, you know, make it reasonable for people to understand. 
I present you a different part of the uh, truth here. You can look at the statistics, see how it's going for yourself. The thing that I want to talk about is most people, not everybody, of course, but I would say a large percentage of people that are working their nine to fives, if they could, they would probably want to buy a home versus rent it. Not all people, and there's people in different situations. Maybe they aren't staying in the city for too long. They don't know what their future has in store. Or there's a lot of different reasons why people would rent over buying, even if they had a lot of money. But that brings me to my point. People don't have money. People don't have savings. They don't have money for a down payment. They do not have enough income coming in to buy a home. So what do they do? They rent. And then, you know, you, you're presented with that truth and then it sort of shakes one's paradigm a little bit because that is a fact. These are all facts. When you look at subprime mortgages, look at what happened previously. Of course, that is still going on today. But see where it was going previously all these people stopped renting and they started buying and they were using subprime to do it and it caused a major catastrophe. That was really the linchpin. That was the spark setting off the financial crisis back in 2008. What I worry about is more people buying homes. Not because I don't want them to own a home, simply because if you can't really afford it, shouldn't be buying it. That goes for anything. The credit card debt, the student debt, everything is just being racked up constantly. Over $200 trillion of debt. And somehow, that's okay. I don't even know what that factors in when you see that, that number. Does that take into account unfunded liabilities? I don't think so. The situation is dire, and we will feel the consequences eventually. I hope that everyone will be prepared the number one way to prepare is to read. Read as much as you possibly can. Understand the situation and just keep that maintenance. Understand you know, what's happening geopolitically. Understanding what's happening in the financial markets and everything else. You don't need to be a stock trader or have any sort of deep analysis on this. We just need to know what's going on. I hope that I'm uh, informative to you. If you feel that way, then please give me a thumbs up. I do appreciate it very much. I try to bring you the maximum amount of information in the shortest period of time. I'm really the one person out there who has really made an effort to try and help out those who are just getting started in this. That's why I have a free e-course available to people. Of course, I wrote the books, but I've made the free e-course out there to get those basics that's available on my website, themoneygps.com. Free e-course. I have uh, free e-books on there as well. I've done all these videos for you to learn from. I hope that uh, I have been some use to you. So once again, you could support me by simply giving me a thumbs up, subscribing to the channel, nearing 70,000 at the time of this recording subscribers. So I want to say hello to each and every one of you. And if you're not already a subscriber, definitely hit that subscribe button. Last but not least, if you found this video informative, I know you will find my books, The Money GPS, and my new release, Global Economic Collapse, even more informative. You can flip through the books at Amazon. Links are in the description below. Take care.